Deputy Pauline Tully. <coughs> and good morning and, and thank you all for coming in here and, and sharing your stories and can commend you for all the work that you're doing to support your, your autistic children and autistic adults in your community. Um, just a quick question on financial support, because some of you have mentioned that. Do I understand that it's all through fundraising? Do you get any government support whatsoever? Um, are there any grants available? I know you've indicated the HSE hasn't been forthcoming. Um, some of you also mentioned that you have managed to engage therapists to offer interventions. And I'm wondering, I mean, we heard from the HSE that they can't, that they can't find them in the community. So how come, you know, they seem to be available? Is it just that they're not worth or were uh, willing to work for the HSE because of various conditions or what, what's your understanding of it? And I know you've talked about um, schools and can I congratulate you, Margaret, you said the number of schools that's been opened in your locality and the pressure you've brought to bring that about. Um, when the school, a uh, special school or an autism class is opened, um, do you find that the staff in it are sufficiently trained, that there's sufficiently trained staff put in? Because we're talking all the time about we need more autism classes, we need them in every school, we need them in every community, so children don't have to travel miles to, to get to a suitable school, and that's correct. But they're often opened without the proper planning and the proper resources being put in. And is that a huge issue, not just in your area, but in any of the areas as well? And also, because of the lack of assessment of children, um, uh, then they don't get the school place that they deserve to get. So is that delay, uh, because maybe it could be years before they're properly assessed, mean that they're not being put in the proper placement and the damage that's probably doing to them um, as we go on. And, and I know a number of you have talked about proposals on the summer provision and um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it needs to be something that's planned now for next year. Um, uh, you know, start the planning process now and maybe start the actual um, putting it in place from January on. And can I thank you, Miriam, that the examples that you sent on there from different principals and different um, people that worked in services are brilliant because um, they give you an insight into what's required. And I find a lot of the schools are saying they're not told, you know, the, the conditions are, are um, they're not given the approval till May. It's far too late. Now, maybe they're using it as partially an excuse not to proceed with the summer provision, but it's also a problem in that they're not told it, what funding is available until May or maybe June. And it is too late. Did this, need, this process needs to start much earlier. But you're right, it needs to um, ensure that the, more, the children with more complex needs are catered to first um, and not left on their own at home, maybe with an unsuitable, if you're lucky enough to get a tutor, an unsuitable uh, home-based um, tuition. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the special school, like, you know, we recognise that there was a need for a special school in the area, and it's not just about getting that building open, it's, it's what everything else that goes with it. So when we did campaign, um, we wanted teachers trained, SNAs trained, um, therapists on site. They were the three other things that we had asked for. Um, no, teachers are not trained enough. Um, the teacher training here is, you know, it's, it's bare minimum when it comes to children with SEN. And, you know, when they do go looking for courses, the NCSC, it, it, it's very limited, very limited places. Um, we found out recently as well is when you open an autism class, you know, you get some programmes from the NCSC, some training. If you open two, three and four, you actually don't get any training. That other teacher has to train that staff, which makes no sense to any of us. You know, training should be mandatory. I know up in the north of Ireland, uh, about, I think it was about two years ago, they were looking to bring in a mandatory training for teachers. Um, I'm not 100% sure if it's gone through. I don't think it has. And I think that's what needs to be brought in down here, mandatory training. It shouldn't be no issue. It's up to the teacher which side they go, but they need to le learn the whole the whole aspect of education. Um, it's the same with the, NC with the NCSE, just don't seem to, you know, they don't seem to think that this is urgent. You know, it's, it's open an autism class, give the go ahead and the teacher trains like two days before, before they go in, or in some cases don't train at all until the, until the children are in there. Um, we actually have an autism class at the moment that is due to open, was due to open on August 24th and didn't open. Um, and it won't open till, October, the week, first week in October. So there is actually children sitting at home um, and that teacher at the moment is currently training. Um, if she was trained up and you just did a continual process, you know, CPD, um, I think that would be, we feel that would be the better way around it, you know. Um, but there's, there's teacher training needs to be mandatory and the INTO and the teaching training colleges need to sit down together and discuss and bring a proper programme in place. 
We were lucky. We, we secured a, a, a small um, piece of funding um, last year from the HSC um, for one part of what's a very big entity at Rainbow Club, and we've been six years trying to even secure that. Um, I suppose we continue. We are continuing to fundraise and and do everything that we can to keep our doors open. Um, but it's it's just it's it's we're not fitting in boxes. I suppose the the Rainbow Club is such a unique model. We we fit under different departments, so we have loads of different elements. We have the summer provision that we roll out ourselves in in Rainbow Club. We're looking at an alternative education piece there, um, and we're we're constantly told, oh look, we 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 don't fit into funding streams. So that's what we need to to be able to fall on. Um, but I think there needs to be a lot of collaboration, more collaboration around the funding pools and um, we 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 have done what we've done in seven years on our own we haven't had help and um, but if we had funding we could do so much more or even just can i just mention there um about ace just what margaret is saying about um the compulsory training um for teachers and snas um, this year in Dublin 15, there were, I think it was 15 children who had come through primary school and there was no um, secondary school place for them. Um, so some of the schools in Dublin 15 were asked to open an autism class. Um, back uh, two years ago, I set up ACE, which is Autism Clubs and Education. So I would receive funding from TUSLA who um, I would source speakers um, to provide free training workshops then to teachers, SNAs and professionals. Um, so I will actually be starting a workshop now come October. Um, so I'll be notifying the schools and we have a Facebook page. So that will be um, back at the beginning, what is autism, understanding autism, setting up an autism class, dealing with anxiety, um, and I just would love for it to be compulsory for schools. I don't think that they should have a choice of, you know, whether they take the training or not. I do think it should be compulsory. And whether they come with ACE and do it through me or whether they, there's Middletown, there are other organisations that offer, um, you know, workshops. And I just think that no teacher, no SNA really should be um, in a class you know, teaching a child with autism that has never had that experience before. Um, that was just something that I wanted to just mention there. Um, just another thing I have planned, which is parent talks, parent information talks, which also are free and is also um, funded by TUSLA. So there we're going for the last four years. So there'll be parent-led autism network, um, free training workshops to help parents who are struggling um, with their children. So we would have both Zoom and in-person um, information talks. Again, all topics autism related. Um, it went nationwide, particularly through COVID. Um, a lot more families with pressure of homeschooling their child um, were reaching out and looking for help. Um, so plan is actually being replicated in Dublin 5, 13 and 17 for the last two years. They have a big launch night actually coming up in October and uh, plan in Balbriggan is very successful as well. So for me, the dream would be to have plan actually rolled out nationwide. I would love to see every county in Ireland, plan Galway, plan Limerick, plan Kilkenny, so on and so on. Um, even if they had the budget there for one speaker, per month and a Zoom license. You can reach out to so many more families. And while they're on waiting lists and, you know, this just, and that's what Tusla recognises, that this is just a little bit of a stopgap. This is, you know, help that you can have um, like that through Zoom in, you know, for some of the talks or to meet with other parents um, and, you know, have the contact with them. So that's just a little bit of, I suppose, what, you know, I've been able to set up myself um, in the last few years and has been um, a really good success, big success. Sorry, yeah, just going time. back to Deputy Tully's point on staff training, um, we're really in the middle of the perfect storm at the moment because we have a combination of no <coughs> staff training and no therapies. When my son was diagnosed eight years ago, we had some access to speech and OT. There was a plan at that stage. So when he started school, the teachers had somebody to refer to around his sensory needs. He had a sensory program. 
Now there's nobody in our CDNTs to see those children. They don't know them in school, they don't know them starting school, they don't know them as they grow up. And the teachers aren't trained to understand the absolute depths of the behaviour of how to teach these children to communicate or how to manage their sensory needs. So it's not really about education or about health. The two of them absolutely are knotted together for, for life, you know. But we're really in a very bad place at the moment when the teachers don't understand the behaviours that are arriving into these many opening autism classes. Thanks, Can I just say about the autism classes too, is that it tends to be um, the first, the last teacher into the school gets the autism class. That's just my experience. So, because it's very hard to teach in an autism class if you have no training and um, it's very stressful on the teacher. And so the schools are kind of making it up as they go along. And I'm sure not all schools, but that's just my experience. So it's the most inexperienced or just out of college um, teacher who gets the class.